So um, the U.S. Student Fulbright Program um, is uh, one of the uh, only awards that kind of uh, continues for current fellowship um, prospective students over the summer term. Um, so it's good that you're starting uh, with this information session now. Um, this is just a way to kind of pique your interest, to get an idea of what the program traditionally looks like. Um, and it will also just kind of give you an idea of um, what all goes into the application process. Um, and as I said, my name is Tony Apps, Associate Director of Graduate Fellowships and Awards. So I'll be your uh, primary contact as you go through the Fulbright uh, application process if you uh, are applying through the U.S. Student Program. Um, the big picture for Fulbright is that it uh, provides a one-year fully funded grant for uh, graduating seniors, recent graduates, graduate students, um, and young professionals up through uh, scholars who are going to be studying in a different country, uh, faculty programs. Um, so the U.S. student program isn't the only one that's available to you, but um, it's the primary one that graduate students are going to be interested in, so that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, and if you have any questions following this, you can always follow up with me at gsfellow at umn.edu. Um, and if this isn't the right program for you, we can try to find which one would work best. So to get started, um, the U.S. Uh, Fulbright, Pro well, the Fulbright program in general um, is an international exchange program. Uh, it was first proposed in 1945 um, by Senator William Fulbright, uh, and it was signed into law in 1946. Um, and this is the flagship international education exchange program sponsored by the U.S. government. Uh, to advance our mission of fostering mutual understanding between nations, advancing knowledge across communities, and improving lives around the world is really the heart of what Fulbright is looking to do. Um, and it's a good thing to keep in mind as you're applying for the program so you can kind of be sure to address the, um, the key elements that Fulbright strives for um, their students to achieve. Um, it's an opportunity to build lasting relationships, expand your network, and advance your career. Um, the Fulbright program not only offers grants to U.S. students and scholars to go abroad, but also offers grants for foreign students and scholars to come to the United States. Um, and since its inception in 1945, the program has grown from uh, 88 grantees in its first year to just over 8,000 annually. And that's across all programs that they offer. Um, the, oh, it's showing up, okay. <laughs> so. Um, diversity and inclusion are cornerstone principles of the program. Um, we are actively, um, both at the University of Minnesota and nationally, uh, recruiting a diverse pool of applicants for the program. Uh, and we encourage all students um, who are interested in spending time abroad in one capacity or another to consider Fulbright. Um, we want this program basically to represent the diversity that makes up um, the United States and the U.S. higher education system. Um, I should note, um, because it may be relevant for some of you, that uh, with regards to sexual orientation and gender identity, um, which obviously uh, don't factor into your application process, um, but there are some countries around the world that have laws that are more restrictive of personal expression. If you have any concerns about this, feel free to reach out to me or uh, any national Fulbright representative. Uh, we work with embassies and consulates around the world to ensure that our students are safe and comfortable in their host countries, regardless of location. So for eligibility, um, awards are open to all disciplines and areas of interest from uh, the hard sciences to the creative and performing arts. Um, applicants to the Fulbright uh, program must be, or sorry, the U.S. student program must be U.S. citizens at the time of application. Um, as I said before, there are some awards that are open to uh, international students, primarily for them to study in the United States, um, but that would be a slightly different application process than what we're discussing right now. Um, ap applicants need to have received their bachelor's degree or the equivalent at the start or before the start of the grant period. 
um, and you can't have a PhD already at the time of application, um, though you can receive it between the application period and when you go abroad, depending on uh, the timing of your program and what works for you. Um, you don't have to be enrolled in a college, university, um, institute of higher education to be eligible for the program. Uh, I know that's not going to be relevant for most of the um, listeners here, um, but for those of you who are maybe thinking a few years out, uh, you might be just figuring out when this is going to work for your purposes. Um, you are able to have uh, a Fulbright during uh, the period following your degree program, um, and you can still get some on-campus assistance with the actual application process, regardless of whether you're a current student or a recent alumni. Um, the, in terms of language proficiency, uh, I just want to touch on that briefly. I'll come back to it. Um, but having sufficient proficiency in the written and spoken language of the host country um, is necessary to communicate with people, obviously, and then to carry out your proposed project. Um, this required proficiency is going to vary by country. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll come back to this element of the application later, but um, it shouldn't be a deterrent if you're not uh, fluent in your host country's language, unless it's necessary for the application. Um, so it's something that you should consider as you're reviewing uh, potential countries that you'd be uh, interested in visiting. Um, and uh, Fulbright is not one program, but um, I believe 140 different programs. Um, so consulting the intended host country page on the website for country-specific detailed information is really important. You can also check with me if you have questions about that. Um, but a lot of the uh, answers to specific questions students have uh, will end up being, it depends. It really depends on the country um, and what you're looking to do. Uh, and there's a lot of options, uh, even within countries available to you. Um, and to make note, uh, during the um, competitive application cycle, um, candidates can only apply for one type of grant. Um, and traditionally grants are for one country. There is a potential, um, uh, there is a potential way for students to apply for grants that would span across multiple countries. This is fairly rare, um, but in order to receive that, you would need to apply and be awarded for each country individually as part of the uh, grant application and review cycle. Uh, so say you had three different countries you were working with. Um, if one of those declines you, then the award would not go through. Um, so it's something you want to consider carefully. And actually, just for one second, I will stop and see if there are questions. Oh, so um, international students would not qualify here. So the information that uh, we're discussing today is primarily for uh, domestic students. So for the U.S. student program, if you are not a U.S. citizen and you won't be one at the time of application, this wouldn't be the correct program for you. Um, but a lot of the information we're going to discuss regarding statements um, and general uh, recommendations for the application process may be relevant. Uh, so definitely up to you whether or not um, you want to sit through the whole uh, presentation. I should note that following the presentation, I'll also send out a copy of the PowerPoint slides um, as well as hopefully uh, a recording of this session uh, to everyone that was on the calendar invite and everyone who registered for the session in general. Okay, so uh, with uh, an annual for the, the U.S. student program uh, specifically, uh, there are over 2,200 awards for 140 different countries. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities that are available if you're considering the Fulbright. Uh, generally, grants fall into two categories, which are open study uh, and research awards, and also uh, English teaching assistantships. So 
for the study research awards, those are very open for you to kind of create your own program, um, both the scope, the depth, um, really tailored to what you're wanting to do in the uh, host country. Um, you might be proposing independent study and research abroad, um, doing independent research while taking classes as a non-degree student at a foreign university, or you might be enrolled in a specific graduate degree program uh, that you're hoping to earn abroad. Um, for independent research, the biggest thing that you're going to be considering is that the project itself is um, compelling and feasible during the period that you're proposing. Um, and for the graduate study uh, element, you should specify the reasons why applying to uh, the proposed program at a particular institution in the host country um, is relevant to what you're looking to do or just why you're interested in that institution in general. Um, applicants um, would be responsible for securing admission to the university uh, through the standard application process in addition to submitting the Fulbright application. For the English Teaching Assistantship, uh, this program places grantees in schools overseas to supplement local English language instruction and to provide a native English speaker presence in classrooms. Um, placements and experiences will vary widely by country. Uh, so the first step is to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with the country um, summary for the program you're hoping to apply to. Um, all at one point, um, go away from this uh, presentation and show you the uh, US Student Fulbright webpage and just where you can go for more detailed information on countries, uh, statistics. Uh, there's a lot of information online that could be helpful. Um, and if you are, a special note, uh, this might not apply to anyone here, but if you're teaching English abroad but also conducting research related to your instruction, this would actually fall under the research grant application category, so something to consider there. Um, and as you'll see, um, there are slightly more um, English teaching assistantships or ETAs uh, available each year than there are research study. Um, but for those of you who are graduate students, you should note that 60% of the research study um, would go to um, undergraduate students, so 40 would be, approximately 40 would be reserved for graduate um, study. Um, but then with the English teaching assistantships, 90% of those go to undergraduate students. So there's actually, if you're a graduate student, far more research study grants available than there are um, English teaching assistantships. So I'm going to just highlight a couple special award opportunities as well as uh, supplemental grants that can go into the Fulbright because these can be confusing when you're looking at the program for the first time. Uh, the first one I have here is the Fulbright Fogarty Fellowship in Public Health. Uh, I'm glad I said that correctly. And um, it's a partnership with the Fogarty International Center um, of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, or NIH, um, and the mission is to promote the expansion of research in public health and clinical research in resource-limited settings. Um, for those of you who may be interested in this, um, individuals need to be enrolled in medical school or graduate-level program who are doing research or work related to public health and, uh, or sorry, global health. Um, there is an office on the University of Minnesota campus that um, does more detailed work with the Fogarty uh, International Center in general, and in the past has been uh, a really helpful resource for students who are interested in this particular award. Um, if eligible, they may even be able to help you with uh, kind of getting initial contacts in uh, your area of interest. Uh, if one of the countries that you're interested in falls within the scope of uh, their existing research context. Um, you would definitely want to, again, review the summary pages for each of the countries for more information. Um, last year's eligible countries um, are all available again this year, um, but it would be limited to uh, Ethiopia, Ghana, uh, Malawi, uh, Uganda, and Guatemala. 
Another special award opportunity um, is the Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship. Um, this is a very competitive uh, award that is part of um, what would be kind of a supplemental element of your uh, Fulbright program. So for this, you would be um, on a traditional Fulbright, but you would also, and sorry, uh, traditional Fulbright for research study. Um, and you would also um, work on storytelling uh, with a globally significant theme during your time abroad. Um, you know, it's an in-depth examination of a globally relevant issue um, with the hope that it's going to advance your Fulbright research or an arts program if that's uh, applicable to you. Applications are accepted in any country where there's uh, Fulbright uh, study research awards with the exception of China. And uh, generally what happens is that you would be selected and approved for your study research. And uh, then in addition to that, they would let you know if you were also awarded the National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship. So it's kind of an additional element um, to a Fulbright award that would be offered. But if you are denied this element of the Fulbright, that doesn't mean you'd be denied for your entire Fulbright. So don't feel as though you shouldn't apply to specific opportunities like this because it won't preclude you from receiving uh, your actual study research award. Um, and I'm happy to say one of our Fulbright recipients for next year actually did receive uh, this fellowship. I think she was one of less than five globally. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, posting more information about her uh, storytelling project when she is able to go abroad, uh, likely next spring. Um, and I should note, uh, for those of you who are concerned, I'm sure that we'll have more questions about this later on, but uh, currently the uh, U.S. Student Fulbright, well, the Fulbright program in general, isn't sending individuals abroad for the time being. Uh, right now, that kind of hold on travel is going until the end of December, so the end of fall term, essentially, uh, for 2020. And then with the hope that students would be able to travel again in spring 2021. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not awarding students or that travel isn't happening. They're just shifting travel so that it's more appropriate given the, the current climate with COVID-19. Um, the last supplemental grant um, or special award I'll discuss is the uh, Critical Language Enhancement Award. So this is, again, supplementary funding for um, U.S. student Fulbright recipients. It would be traditionally three months, sometimes as much as six months, of intensive language study in your specific host country. Um, you'll see on the slide there are specific eligible countries and eligible dialects, so it is restricted to those um, that Fulbright has listed as eligible. Um, normally what would happen is that you would receive your Fulbright and then in addition you may be granted this enhancement award. Um, if you are, the critical language element would happen before the start of your Fulbright period, so you would have time to really ingrain yourself in the local languages and dialects uh, prior to the start of the, the research or teaching elements of your award. And I am going to now discuss award benefits, but I will once again stop sharing for a moment to see. I don't think we have any questions yet. Uh, again, feel free to send those in the chat as things come up, but uh, no pressure. I will also address questions at the end. Um, and I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you right now. So uh, the actual dollar amount of the grant uh, varies by country and award type, um, but all grants provide uh, round trip transportation from the US to the host country, uh, funding to cover housing, meals and incidentals, and basic accident and sickness health benefits. Um, living costs are based on uh, the graduate students uh, general standard of living, uh, so there's an assumption that graduate students um, might not have the um, largest and most extravagant apartments available in your host country, um, but would create, um, give you enough funding for um, basic living accommodations, 
uh, within the host country. So the cost of living is going to vary greatly depending on where you are, whether you're in uh, a capital or a remote area. Um, and if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, some optional benefits include support for dependents, research allowance, tuition, uh, language lessons, or enhancement activities. Those vary, uh, again, by host country and by the grant that you receive. Um, so usually if there is possible supplementary funding available for the country, that will be listed somewhere on their information page. Um, specific countries, I believe Germany being one of them, um, has slightly more funding uh, for these extended benefits um, because they're one of the, the largest host countries uh, for the U.S. student Fulbright. So, depending on where you go, there will be different resources available. Um, disability resources are also uh, available to grantees. Um, applicants with disabilities are encouraged to contact Mobility International at miusa.org for more information about support that's available internationally. And then following the uh, Fulbright Award, there's, uh, there's always this post-grant element of uh, once, once you're Fulbright, you're always Fulbright. So you'll be part of their network of alumni. Um, you would uh, have uh, eligibility for hiring status, um, non-competitive eligibility, sorry, for hiring status within the uh, federal government. Uh, you would have a Fulbright email address and you would have the uh, association with the Fulbright program that would follow you long after the award ends. So application components. Um, as you will see before I even get started here, uh, this is a fairly involved application. Generally, we would recommend you leave three months of time to go through the entire application process. Um, whether that be a research study or an ETA, uh, there are elements of the application that are, you know, outside of your control um, in terms of uh, your references, your uh, affiliation statement, things that it's hard to get within a short period of time. So if you're starting to think about this now to apply in the fall, definitely think of the summer as the period of time when you're really going to be wanting to work on elements of this application. Um, the basic application is um, you would have uh, personal biographical data um, about, about yourself, your um, future plans, uh, interest in the host country, um, and then you would go into the essay section, which is really the heart of the application. Um, the biggest thing here is the uh, who, what, where, when, why, and how of your project. Um, if you are doing the uh, research study, you would have two pages max to accomplish this, and with an ETA, you would have one page maximum. Um, for research study awards, you would really want to detail in an intellectually compelling uh, way your project uh, proposal, uh, justification for um, pursuing this particular project, and really, um, and I'll hammer this home a lot, but the feasibility of the project that you're proposing. Uh, you want to make clear why you must go to the host country in order to complete the proposed research um, and demonstrate that you have the requisite uh, academic and professional experience uh, in order to fulfill the elements that you've described in your proposal. Um, for the ETA, um, which again is English teaching um, assistantship, um, you have one page to detail why you're interested in teaching English uh, to non-native speakers, as well as why you've chosen to apply in a particular country. Um, you should describe any teaching or related experience while uh, describing what you would bring to the classroom in your host country, including uh, potential lesson plans, uh, activity ideas, or uh, basic educational strategies you would want to implement. And the other essay is a personal statement, which is a one-page biography uh, in a narrative form. 
And it's really an opportunity to introduce yourself to the screening committee um, and give an idea of your personal style. Um, the tone of the statements is up to the writer, but uh, the content should convey your background and motivation for applying to the program um, and how this fits within your future plans. You'll also see, which um, I'll touch on briefly, a uh, foreign language evaluation may be required depending on the country. Um, you would need to have three references, uh, which is fairly standard for most uh, fellowship applications and a campus committee evaluation. And that is for individuals who are applying through the university through my office. Um, and I'll discuss that process a little bit more later. Um, other basic things would be transcripts, uh, affiliation letters, which we'll touch on. Um, and if you're applying in um, an artistic field, uh, there are likely going to be supplemental materials that are unique to you. So for the statement of grant purpose, um, and this is specific to research study applicants, um, most graduate students I work with do fall into this category. So I'm going to kind of hammer home uh, certain elements of this uh, application element. Um, you need to develop a compelling and feasible project uh, or justification for pursuing uh, your graduate degree program abroad. Um, and you need to ensure that you're writing your statement based on the general guidelines for the host country that you're interested in. Um, if you're proposing an independent research project, um, this is where you get into the small specifics, but um, in a way that um, you, can, you can do within two pages. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a lot of things you need to incorporate into this very limited amount of space, um, which I think is really why this is a challenging statement to write. Um, you really uh, should also look through the Fulbright website if you haven't already, uh, just to kind of consider the language that they use in the um, program proposal, um, in their supplementary materials, um, one of the primary goals of Fulbright is to promote cultural exchange and mutual understanding. So when you're writing your statements, you should be considering that goal and how you're addressing that uh, throughout your material. Um, other things you might want to consider, uh, a timeline for your project, um, why does it need to be in this selected country, which is very important, um, how this would uh, further your educational goals, um, and uh, what your qualifications would be for uh, carrying out the proposed project. I told you I would hammer home feasibility. Um, feasibility is so, so important for uh, research that you are proposing to do abroad. Um, if you have an amazing idea for a project that would take multiple visits to a country over several years and you don't carve out the portion that would be this particular trip abroad, it's very difficult for the review committee to determine whether or not it's feasible for you to do that project. So this can be one element of your research that's um, you know, partially through Fulbright, partially through uh, funding through an advisor or another award. Uh, there's nothing at all wrong with that. but you should really focus on what your particular um, Fulbright specific uh, study would be, uh, what you're accomplishing during those um, eight to 10 to 12 months abroad, um, and how you're going to accomplish that work. So do you have a potential mentor or advisor in the host country? Do you have a way to um, get access to the materials you need to do the project you're proposing? Um, do you have the appropriate language skills? Um, and something you should consider is, are there any possible feasibility concerns that you have? Because if there are questions in your own mind about feasibility, I can guarantee you that uh, reviewers will pick up on that and have the same questions. 
So try to look at this uh, element critically and think about the ways that you're addressing uh, any potential concerns that you have yourself about how this project would work abroad. The affiliation letter, um, and I have received some questions about um, this element. Um, the requirements for the affiliation letter uh, differ depending on the country you're applying to. Um, and that may look, um, that may look different depending on what uh, your host site is going to be. Some countries will say that you need to be hosted by um, one of a handful of uh, institutions, universities, and colleges that exist in the country in order to be eligible to apply for a Fulbright in that country. Um, others are very open. You could be doing independent work. You could be um, connecting with researchers, working in labs, libraries, or NGOs. Um, it really, really spreads the gamut in terms of um, different options that are available to you uh, overall through Fulbright. And then those are going to be narrowed down depending on the country and what you're specifically doing. So again, please, please go to the uh, country specific pages on the US Student Fulbright page for more information about what's required in your country. Um, getting the affiliation letter is something that can be challenging because it's very much up to you as the applicant. You can um, you know, definitely pull on your network of resources ask uh, current or former uh, uh, faculty members or professors you've worked with that um, have contacts in that country to help you make those introductions. Um, depending on where you're going, that might uh, mean that someone uh, who's a scholar that's studying here from that country would know of faculty members doing specific work in that host country. There's a lot of different ways you can make that connection. Um, Another way is, uh, frankly, uh, cold calling people, um, sending emails to faculty researchers that are doing uh, work that's of interest to you in that country and seeing what it would take uh, for them to uh, help you make the connections you need to do the research that you're proposing in the country. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this can look, um, and there's no one size fits all affiliation letter. Um, but given our current circumstance um, with COVID-19 and a lot of um, colleges, universities being closed, uh, it may take longer for you to secure this letter. A lot of people are doing obviously work um, remotely where they would normally be on campus. Uh, so it's very possible that uh, it may just take slightly longer for you to make the appropriate connections with faculty members um, who are doing their research uh, elsewhere or might be on hold in terms of what they're able to do currently. Um, but that doesn't mean that in a year or two's time that those same resources won't be available to you again. Um, I don't think anyone knows exactly what's going to happen in the coming months with travel restrictions, but um, try to, when you're looking into the affiliation letter, um, think of it in terms that are kind of pre-COVID-19, um, if all goes well and campuses are open and you're able to uh, get all the resources you would have been able to um, at another time, uh, those are what our uh, screeners and reviewers are going to be looking for. Um, you know, there might be some elements of your work that could be affected uh, by our current uh, climate, but, um, you know, in the coming months, we'll, we'll assess that more and see whether or not you need to address that in your letter. Um, but I'm not anticipating that for your um, cohort of students going abroad, that's still going to be um, as forward facing as it is right now. And actually, I will pause briefly. No, I don't think we have any questions. Okay. Um, and again, feel free to send any questions you have uh, in the chat. So for the foreign language evaluation, um, you may or may not need to submit this element. Um, again, it varies by country. Uh, so before starting your application, take note of what the requirements would be for your host country. 
Um, if language skills are strongly recommended, you would need to uh, submit both a language self-evaluation and a foreign language evaluation form. Um, and there are instructions for um, completing that form through the Fulbright website. Um, it may be, um, so a lot of countries will say that um, basic language skills are recommended, not required, it, it really ranges. Um, but for the purposes of community engagement, it may be advantageous for you to have basic language skills, even if they're not required um, for the host country to approve your application. Um, and this comes into um, elements of the personal statement as well, because um, in the personal statement, so you're not describing research, you're talking about your background, what's led you to want to go to the country of your choice. Um, part of what you want to address there is how are you going to be um, a Fulbright ambassador when you're abroad in your host country? Um, and it may be difficult to get that point across if you don't um, have any familiarity with the local dialect. Um, and when I say connection to the host country, it's just um, making sure that you're going to have connections to your host country outside of the research you're doing. So that may mean you're volunteering um, at a local NGO. It may mean that um, you're very interested in tennis and you're going to look into intramural uh, teams that you can join while you're there. Um, we've had students that want to join knitting circles. There's, there's all kinds of different ways you can engage with your local community, much like you can here. Um, and you should be giving some thought to what those connections might be if you're selected for a Fulbright in future, um, and whether or not language might come into that um, uh, elements of community engagement that you're proposing. So recommendation letters. Um, these are, again, something where there's no one size fits all for everyone, um, but you should definitely select three individuals who can best speak to your ability to carry out your proposed project. Um, character references on paper may um, look compelling, but they don't tell reviewers very much about um, your qualifications to conduct the work that you're proposing. Um, a lot of times you might uh, look to faculty members for those kind of statements, um, but it doesn't have to necessarily be um, three letters from three faculty members. Um, really anyone who is familiar with your skills and abilities and um, those that would transfer um, well to the proposed project, to your proposed um, graduate study abroad, if you're proposing that, um, your skills as an English uh, teaching assistantship. Um, all of those uh, elements are unique. So find individuals who can speak to those unique skills. Um, you should also, um, and another reason why you should start the application process early, um, is that you should provide copies of your statement of grant purpose and your personal statement to your letter writers. Um, even if they're draft copies, um, it'll help them write better recommendation letters. They'll be more tailored to what you are trying to convey to the selection committee. Um, and it also, um, oh, there's also uh, instructions for recommendation writers on the Fulbright website. So be sure to also uh, connect them with that information. I'll also say you should register your recommenders in the Fulbright application system early. Um, they'll need access to upload their letters and usually, especially over the summer term, if you're um, talking with academics, they might need more time to complete those references and to get everything uploaded. So make sure that um, they have access to do all of that well in advance of the deadline to do so. Um, so you're not, you know, going back to individuals who are kindly writing letters and saying, can you please hurry up? Um, I know. <laughs> That can be a challenge sometimes. So definitely make sure you give them plenty of lead time so you're not waiting on those elements of your application. Oops, sorry. Um, factors and selection. Um, so 
basically selection is made on the basis of uh, the quality and feasibility of the proposal, uh, the academic or professional record of the student applying, uh, personal qualifications, language preparation, um, and preference factors established by the uh, Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, um, and the extent to which the candidate and the project will help to advance Fulbright's aim of promoting mutual understanding and achieving diversity. So again, refer back to Fulbright's goals um, the language that they use on their website. Um, make sure you're speaking their language to some degree. Um, know what their expectation is for scholars and use that to your advantage when you're writing uh, your proposal. Additionally, each country may also have specific requirements that are um, required regarding eligibility and uh, preference for selection. Um, so I am actually going to take the opportunity to pull up the, I hope everyone's able to see this, um, the Fulbright uh, page for the U.S. student program, just to kind of show you where things live on here. Um, the first place you can go, well, first, um, the About section will give you um, ideas of uh, eligibility, factors of selection, um, award benefits, all the things that I've been talking about. Um, but then you can also go down into types of awards such as the uh, storytelling fellowships, the fellowships in public health, and get more information on those. Um, but where you're going to spend a lot of time is likely in the country section for your host country that um, you're proposing. Um, I'll just show you a little variation of what these might look like. Um, for a country like the United Kingdom, for example, um, their Open Research Study Awards can vary quite a bit because they have um, prescribed numbers for each um, type of award and also um, particular institutions. Uh, so even though they have a lot of awards available, um, you might be one of many people who are applying for uh, maybe one slot at the country's um, or for the particular award program. Um, so something to consider, and I'll show you this again um, for the United Kingdom when we go into the statistics area. Um, but it will um, definitely lay down um, the specific interest of the program um, what they're looking for in terms of uh, the parameters of uh, the award and what candidates would meet that. Um, other countries you might see are a little bit more open uh, in terms of their requirements. They would have um, maybe guidelines on the uh, type of um, review process. Um, for example, some countries will have brief interview periods um, before they make final selections. Many do not, um, but you can find that information again on the host country's webpage. Um, they might tell you the specific type of students they're looking for, um, whether or not there are um, required elements outside of the project that you're proposing, um, language proficiency, obviously, and then the types of affiliations that you can have. Uh, when going to that host uh, institute. Um, other countries might be, if I remember correctly, Donna would be one of them, um, a little bit more open in that they don't have a specific number of uh, awards that are available. Some countries are actually reviewed in um, sub-regions of uh, the world, so you might have um, the southernmost um, part of uh, uh, continent where all of the um, countries are reviewed together. Uh, they're grouped in various ways. It's a little bit, um, as you can tell, difficult for me to describe. Um, but there might not be um, much in terms of requirements uh, for the actual application, um, which may lead you with more questions. But um, again, there's always some direction that's given here. Um, and uh, another point of context that may be interesting uh, for some of you is that um, the consulates and embassies a lot of the times will have their websites listed 
and they'll have more information there about uh, the program requirements for doing research or study, um, receiving research clearance, like you see here uh, for Ghana. Um, and also some countries will have a specific host individual, um, or sorry, um, contact individual for um, the particular host country's um, Fulbright review program. So you could ask them specific information. They might be able to connect you with uh, eligible institutions. Um, it's just one more person that you can kind of utilize to answer some of those questions and make decisions about um, how your application process is proceeding. Um, as I mentioned, there are statistics available on here also. Uh, so again, countries are on the drop-down menu at the top. Statistics are over in the upper right-hand side. Um, you can see how many applicants there are for particular awards and how many are awarded. Uh, this is for the um, National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship. Um, as you can see, some of these are very competitive. Um, and this may actually be helpful for when you're determining which country you'd like to apply to if you have interest across a particular region. Um, let me just choose a few at random. Um, you can see that uh, for China in 2020-2021, um, there were 82 applications for 50 awards, so um, more than a 50% award rate, which is really outstanding for this kind of program. Um, but for countries that receive uh, a large, large number of applications, and uh, I'll try to reference the United Kingdom here, the award rate is actually much lower. Um, so for uh, Open Study Award, uh, two awards available for 147 applications. Um, and you can go down and look through all of their particular awards to see which ones are most competitive um, and just all the different options that are available to you. Um, so if you're deciding between the United Kingdom and somewhere else um, in Europe, you might want to um, consider the award rate when you're making that decision. For questions. Okay, so um, Hannah had a question about language evaluators. Do evaluators need to be language professors or can they be colleagues who are native speakers? That's a really good question. So um, for, um, for the language evaluation piece, it depends on the particular language that you're looking at. Um, if, for instance, you um, need to be fluent or um, conversational in Spanish, we would look for um, evaluators that were um, language professors in Spanish specifically. Um, that's because, you know, at any institution, it would be much easier to connect with um, someone who was teaching French or Spanish regularly. Um, any country uh, or any dialect that would be easily found on a university's roster of available languages, you should try to connect with someone who uh, is actually an instructor in that language. Um, if you're looking at a particular dialect that is much more specific to uh, a region that is not regularly taught at your university, um, or if it's very difficult to uh, make contact with someone who would be a faculty member teaching in that particular language or dialect, um, then you would instead look for someone who is a native speaker and um, by Fulbright guidelines, um, also someone with a uh, college degree, uh, I believe is still the requirements and they can um, actually do that evaluation with you instead. Um, so if you're curious about um, the particular language or dialect uh, that you would need to be evaluated on, feel free to check with me um, and we can see uh, kind of the feasibility uh, for students at the University of Minnesota. Um, but essentially, get a language instructor if you can, and if you can't, then um, someone else who's a uh, college-educated native speaker uh, can be that source for that evaluation instead.
So for the campus uh, interview process, uh, this is unique to uh, each individual institution. Um, the University of Minnesota's process um, is fairly well established, so you may already be familiar. Um, but typically students would submit um, intent to apply notification by August 1st. Um, either letting me know that you intend to apply via um, that Google form, uh, which is on the uh, Fulbright page on the university's website, um, or sorry, the University of Minnesota, so the Graduate School website on our Fulbright uh, page, you would see a link to the intent to apply notification. Um, you can also send me an email um, at gsfellow at umn.edu. Um, any way that you can contact me and let me know in advance that you'll be applying, um, ideally by August 1st would be amazing. Um, this is because um, for our review processes, um, I try to group um, applications by specific regions uh, so that when you sit down with our review committee, you're speaking with individuals who are looking at a particular part of the world um, and uh, maybe more focused in the guidance that they're able to give to you rather than a general committee that's reviewing uh, applications across all host countries. Um, so you would let me know that you're applying in one way or another, and then you would submit your Fulbright application, um, and that includes all components, by August 26th. So well in advance of the national deadline, which I'll show you on my next slide. Um, but the reason for this is that following that August 26th uh, deadline, you would have an in-person interview with a committee of University of Minnesota faculty members. Um, so like I said, we'll group applicants by country or general area of the world um, so that faculty members will be um, familiar with the host country's selection process. Um, if possible and feasible, uh, we would include a language component in the interview. So if you're traveling to Germany and it's required that you speak uh, German at the institute that you're going to be hosted at, um, ideally, we will have a German-speaking faculty member who can um, make a basic conversation with you uh, during the interview process, um, just as one more evaluator of your potential skills. The uh, interviews are roughly 30 minutes in length, um, and the committee may suggest uh, changes. Um, to strengthen your application, um, or as a result of the question and answer period you have with them, you may decide to make changes. Um, I should note that when I say your uh, application needs to be submitted by August 26th, it needs to be submitted uh, via the standard Fulbright application that's online. Um, I then have the ability following your interview to unsubmit that application so you can go back in and make changes um, and alterations as you see fit. Um, and you would have up until um, we'd establish a date, maybe a few days in advance of the national deadline um, to resubmit all of that information again uh, so that you're ready to go when the application closes. And following the interview, the committee will write an evaluation for each applicant that they've met with and had an interview with. Um, these would either endorse or not endorse you on behalf of the University of Minnesota um, and would essentially provide one more um, letter of recommendation for your application. Um, so it's a unique form, but uh, for the most part, we're using it as an opportunity to really highlight the skills and abilities of the applicants um, that we're meeting with. Um, the uh, issue of endorsing or not endorsing it's very rare for one of our committees to not endorse a student. Um, they have done so in the past if they think the student uh, isn't prepared to go abroad, um, if they, they don't have the proper contacts in place and they think that uh, the student would struggle unnecessarily, in which case they might say that they're not endorsing the student but encouraging them to apply the following year. Um, and they'll be fairly transparent with you if um, they think that it'd be in your best interest to wait. Um, we may also uh, choose to not endorse uh, because uh, an applicant would say, um, 
have political or other personal motivations for going to a region uh, that we think don't meet with uh, the spirit of Fulbright in general. Um, again, very rare, um, but the committee does reserve the right to not endorse an applicant um, if we think they're not a good match or they shouldn't be going abroad for the proposed period of time. Um, and that being said, even if our committee didn't endorse you, which if we have one a year, it's pretty rare, um, Fulbright will still review all of your application materials and they may choose to award you anyway. Um, as a, just a fail safe that um, there aren't any uh, negative consequences to students or any uh, on-campus review processes that might not be uh, considering all of the elements of your application. Um, it's just one more way to assure that um, Fulbright is making the final decision when it comes to uh, all application materials. So a basic application timeline, um, like I said, May to August is designing the project, preparing the application. Uh, August 1st um, is the uh, hopeful deadline uh, for you to uh, let us know whether or not you're applying so that we can prepare for interviews to start in September, uh, campus deadline being August 26th. Um, and then the national deadline for this year is uh, October 13th. So we'd be working throughout the month of September to finalize uh, your application and um, go through the campus interview process. Um, I should note, we will, I'll be working with you along the way to make sure that absolutely everything is ready to go by the national deadline. Um, Fulbright doesn't accept applications after that date and time. Um, at that period, it would go to uh, national screening committees. So there are, I'm sure, hundreds of national screening committees uh, that happen for Fulbright every year in the United States. Uh, they'll group you by region, by type of proposal. Um, there's an initial review process and then usually a secondary review process uh, before they'll make uh, decisions on semifinalists. Uh, there's then a host country review. So it would go to uh, the Fulbright Commission, uh, the US Embassy in the country, a consulate, uh, whoever handles the Fulbright review process for that host country or region. Um, and they would make decisions um, between January and May. Um, I think we actually did get one decision in January this year. And um, true to form, I'm waiting on one last student to be accepted or declined. Um, at the beginning of May now. Um, so anytime during that period, you can find out whether or not you've been uh, awarded for the following year. And then the uh, notification process happens immediately following that. Um, I should also note that for those of you who have unique circumstances or are unsure of whether or not uh, you would want to go through the campus review process, you can technically also apply at large, which means you would go through um, all of the same official Fulbright review, but you would apply directly by uh, the October 13th deadline and not do the campus interview whatsoever. Um, that shouldn't necessarily hurt your chances of receiving the award, um, but there's usually a question of, you know, if they're a current student, why did they not go through the campus process? Um, I'll indicate um, on my end through the Fulbright website if I've been in communication with a student, but for whatever reason we couldn't work out an interview. Um, you were abroad, you were defending your thesis, there's any number of reasons why um, that timeline just might not work for you. So it's not necessarily uh, a deterrent um, for uh, being awarded, um, but Fulbright might look a little bit more closely to see what the specific reasoning was for not doing the uh, initial review process, and you don't have the benefit of that um, endorsement by the campus review committee, um, which, like I said, can be um, in its own way another recommendation letter for your application. So um, please feel free uh, to contact me with any questions that you have about the program. Uh, Fulbright has a lot of different ways to be connected with them online. Um, they have webinars that will go into even more detail about particular elements if you're interested. Um, they're 
uh, websites. They have um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, anything that you could want to uh, learn more about the program. Um, and I'll also take a moment to quickly highlight some of my favorite um, student organizations within school, right? Um, these are all through Instagram, though some of them have uh, separate uh, websites available. Uh, Fulbright Noir, which uh, is celebrating the accomplishments of Black Fulbright grantees, uh, Fulbright Latinx, and Fulbright Prism. Um, these are, um, they, they range in age, but um, fairly newer compared to the, the program overall programs where um, students are connecting with each other, uh, they're highlighting uh, past and present uh, Fulbrighters, um, and it's just one more way to be connected with others that are part of that uh, greater Fulbright family. Um, again, once you're a Fulbright, you're kind of always a Fulbright. Um, so it's uh, one more way you can look into the program and see what other students are doing if you're interested in applying um, all the way through your actual um, fellowship year. So I will again stop sharing my screen uh, and come back to you here just to see if anyone has uh, any questions. Um, yeah, uh, we still have some time. Uh, I won't keep people longer than they need, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, I'll stick around for the next couple of minutes just to answer things as they come up. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining today. Um, feel free to reach out to me at gsfellow at umn.edu, um, and I'll connect you with uh, whatever resources I have available for Fulbright applicants. And I uh, look forward to working with you in the next coming months. And again, if you have a question you want me to unmute you because it's easier, just let me know and I can do that too. should be unmuted, so feel free to go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was just looking at the um, affiliation uh, requirements, um, and I'd be looking at uh, Kenya uh, for the work, and I do see that it says affiliation with um, Kenyan government ministries or research institutions are, accept uh, are acceptable, and I've currently got an affiliation with a Kenyan agency for research that I'm already doing over there, um, but was wondering about as far as like an NGO, like there, would they specifically say there if partnering with an NGO was accept, acceptable? You know, it's hard to say. Um, it sounds like with the wording there that they might be fairly open. Uh, to different types of affiliations because they've noted that um, certain affiliations are acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, if you're not sure, you can always, uh, again, look at the, um, the embassy contact information at the bottom of the country page. Um, typically, if they are, you know, in general, and again, this is very by country, um, but Typically, if they are requiring a particular type of affiliation, they'll say that really specifically. Um, and if they don't say that one type only is um, appropriate or that other types of affiliations aren't allowed, generally that would mean anything in between would be fine. Um, but you can always um, contact me and we can dig a little bit deeper on that also. Um, 
you, sometimes you have to read into the uh, the wording a little bit more than you think um, right. to get the the idea there. Right, right. And I guess for for me, one of it is where I'd be interested in doing research is uh, at a more remote site. It's not in Nairobi, so it's away from the universities. Um, so being affiliated with an agency or uh, an NGO has a lot of appeal. Um, but because I've currently got an affiliation with an, uh, an agency over there, I understand the challenges of that. Um, and so I'm exploring like if there's another option for uh, another, uh, for an NGO where it may be a little more uh, easier rather than dealing with the bureaucracy, bureaucracy associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess one of the questions associated with that is if I've already got research and collaborations that I'm working on over there, is that a hindrance or a help to the application? Are they looking for people who are, you know, going somewhere for the first time? So it's another, uh, it's another one of those where I'm going to say it depends on the country. Um, typically they'd be looking for someone who's not spent, um, and this is just across all fields, right? Someone who hasn't spent in a lot of time in the country, especially immediately leading up to the period of uh, study that you're proposing. Um, but other countries, it's um, more of a help than a hindrance, especially if there are really specific guidelines for the way research is conducted in the country. They might uh, be more trusting of someone who's already been there and is accustomed with their system of approval. Uh, going through all the bureaucracy that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I should mention is that uh, for the affiliations, what some students have done when there's a primary affiliation, but they also need access to uh, materials or locations that aren't available through uh, whoever that host affiliation is, is that they'll have multiple affiliation letters. Um, and you can connect with multiple institutions to say, uh, for the most part, I'm going to be housed at this institute, and then um, following my first month there, I'm actually going to be following up with an NGO uh, elsewhere in the country to get access to their materials and data. Um, that's very much acceptable. Um, so it's something that, um, you know, you have to feel out if that's the best um, course of action for you to conduct the work that you're proposing, um, but is another option that's available. Um, but, um, yeah, to refer to the, the second part of the question, typically if there's a restriction on, um, your connection with the country, or if they prefer someone who's going there for the first time, they'll usually spell it out on the country page. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll also unmute Rebecca here. I think she had a question also. Hi, Tony. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm not planning on applying this year, but I was just curious if you have general advice on things to be doing um, for the year leading up to the next application cycle, just to put together the strongest application possible. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, I will regularly have students who, um, you know, immediately following the um, deadline for the current year will start working on the next year's application. Um, and it, it really depends, too, on what you're looking to do um, and the complexity of your project. Um, leading up to um, when you're going to be going abroad, it's never too early to think about uh, the affiliation letter. Um, and you don't need to have it in hand, obviously, nine, ten months before the application deadline. Um, but just making connections with individuals in the host country, um, essentially determining the best uh, place for your research to take place um, and options for um, connections when you're there. Um, do you have an idea of what you're wanting to do for your project? I do. Um, so the project would be in Colombia and it would be agriculture based. So I guess another question I have um, on the same theme when you meet with PhD students about this, do they propose the Fulbright as a full chapter of their thesis? I just feel like it's a little risky to hedge my bets on a really competitive grant 
and not have a backup plan of what I would do, you know, regardless of getting the grant. Sorry if that's badly phrased. Oh, no, that makes total sense. I actually get that question a fair amount. Um, the Fulbright doesn't necessarily, um, by, by design, I guess, it doesn't have to be a primary element in your thesis or dissertation uh, that you're working on. Some students will actually apply in their last year with the thought that they're going to go abroad immediately following their defense. Um, just depending wow. on what your goals are, um, what you're hoping to accomplish during the fellowship year, um, you can absolutely propose uh, the project as a major element of the research that you're doing. Um, but if you do that, I would recommend that um, you kind of have multiple plans for how you would do that research abroad, um, because it may be required for the work that you're proposing through your dissertation, uh, regardless of the Fulbright Award, um, in which case you would want to talk to your, obviously, faculty advisor about potential funding sources. Um, depending on the region, there are other uh, opportunities to conduct research abroad that you could be applying for simultaneously. Um, we also have the thesis research travel grant through the university graduate school. Um, so that would be for international travel, a grant of $5,000. So much smaller than the Fulbright, but it might kind of help you getting that project off the ground if you aren't awarded the Fulbright, but you've already planned on it as a major element of what you're doing for your research. So oh, okay. yeah, it really depends on um, what's the best fit for you. Um, you can even, you know, apply for some of those awards in advance of the Fulbright deadline so you know if you'll have um, supplemental or alternative funding lined up for the work that you're wanting to do. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different things you can start to work on um, in the meantime, whether that be your actual application or if it's just finding different ways, if you're committing to doing uh, part of your dissertation abroad, various ways you can make that happen regardless of the results of the Fulbright. And some of those um, potential contacts you make uh, looking for the, that eventual affiliation letter may also you know, be beneficial to you in the work that you're doing regardless of the Fulbright. Gotcha, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think that's everything now. So uh, I'll go ahead and sign off, but thank you so much for joining. Um, and I look forward to talking with um, those of you who are applying uh, in the coming year over the summer months. Uh, just let me know uh, when you have questions come up. All right, thanks so much.